Welcome to season eight of the Life Giver Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Weathers. I'm a military spouse, clinician, and leadership coach. And Life Giver is where I get to spark honest conversations, interview experts, and encourage you with topics on military culture, marriage, and leadership. So give yourself permission to pause and lean in. There's something for everyone here. Weathers here. Welcome to season eight of the Life Giver podcast and the first interview of the season. I am so excited to share Shanti Feldhand with you. She is one of my favorite authors, um, one of Matt's favorite authors when it comes to marriage. Um, she has written um, actually one of my favorite marriage books, which is for women only and for men only. Um, you can find it on Amazon. It's so, such an easy, quick read. It's one of the top books that I recommend to couples when they're working through things like conflict, um, differences in sexuality, um, how they both understand love and view love and um, give and receive love. I mean, it's just a fantastic book. You can get it. Um, it's actually two books for women only and for men only, or you can get the combined version of that is for couples only, but she has also written um, for young women only. If you are parenting um, teen girls, um, there is also the good news about marriage. She's put out one about finances. Um, and of course, um, I think it's called the secrets to highly happy marriages where she actually studied the happiest marriages that she could possibly find to figure out what was the common denominator. So she, um, brings this love of research and analytics to just really hearing the stories of couples and normalizing all of our fears and insecurities, probably our conflicts too. And I think that's probably why she's been on this mission, really, I think, to cover some of the biggest topics that couples struggle with. So when I heard that she was teaming up with Dr. Mike Seitzma, who if you've listened to this podcast, you know he's a great friend of ours, um, a colleague, and also just an incredible mentor. So when I knew she was uh, partnering up with Dr. Mike, I just knew this was going to be a fantastic book. So their book together is called Secrets of Sex and Marriage, where they combined her research side of things and his clinical side of things and wrote this fantastic book. Also very easy to read, and you could probably read it in a weekend. I'm really excited to not only share an interview with Shanti, but also a follow-up interview with Dr. Mike, which will be the next episode out. So you get to hear from both of them on um, some of these secrets that they found. So I'm really excited to share my interview with Shanti Feldhan. Shanti, you are one of my favorite authors um, in all of the work that I do. Um, I, your books are the ones that I share with military families every single time I have the opportunity to. I was They were actually in my hands yesterday when I was working with a couple yesterday. Um, today is just with Shanti and I'm, we have so much to cover. So Shanti, welcome to the Life Giver Podcast. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Oh, I appreciate it. I preach the, appreciate the chance to be back with you. Just as a quick reminder to those listening in your car or listening, um, this is going to be probably more adult content. So it's probably not going to be great for little small ears running around. So maybe save this episode for a time when you can put your earbuds in or just be in the car by yourself, wherever you are. So Shanti, I think to start off, um, your newest book, Secrets of Sex and Marriage, Eight Surprises That Make All the Difference, just came out. Um, um, and but this has been a project that you've been working on for a long time. Yes. So would you <laughs> like to just kind of set the stage? I know, and maybe listeners don't realize just how much your work is fueled by research. And we're going to talk about some of yeah. the, the other books and the other research that you've done. Um, but no, n none of your writing is just an impulsive, I feel like writing this today. Like you really have a research background and a social scientist, I think, approach to the culture. And so share with everybody a little bit more about this particular project and how long you guys have been working on it. Yeah, this it, all of all of the background over the last almost 20 years, which is crazy even saying that, that it's 
been almost 20 years since we've been doing this. Jeff and I, my husband and I, um, we both have analytical backgrounds, not like our co-author on the book, Dr. Seitzma, you know, who is a sex therapist and he's been, you know, with couples in his therapy office for 30, 35 years. And we are so not that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We, what we feel called to is to use that analytical and research background to really dig into the easiest way of saying it is what are the little things that make a big difference? What is it that the average husband and wife, for example, if it's a marriage project, what is it that they just don't get? Right. What is it that's maybe causing the heartache that doesn't have to be there? (laughs) And so one of the things that we feel called to do and led to do really is to investigate those things. And so for this topic of sex and intimacy, which is obviously is such a big issue in marriage. Um, And there's so many people that are going through, you know, disappointment or heartache or confusion or whatever. And we thought, well, okay, maybe there is something to learn here. And so we spent, uh, worked with Dr. Mike to be the co-author on this because of his his background, because of, as a sex therapist, he could make sure that everything was completely accurate. And, um, and we spent three years, um, meeting with him (laughs) for three or four hours every Wednesday, digging into his expertise and, um, doing interviews and focus groups. And it culminates in, um, several nationally representative surveys in order to really quantify what is it that matters. Well, and I love that, you know, when I think about the way that you describe those two different worlds, I love, I mean, I'm a clinician myself. And so there's something about the clinical relationship where, you know, when you're sitting there with a client, you almost get it. I mean, yes, there's a lot of normalizing thoughts and behaviors and and telling you, you know, you're, you're not alone and whatever it is that you're going through. But there's also a little bit of like, let's just talk about you and what's normal for you. And let's really focus on um, your life and not necessarily compare it to everybody. And yet what you are bringing is this other kind of peace element of, you know, let's actually do the research and find the data and see what, how do we calm people's anxiety by knowing what are most people feeling? What are most yes. people thinking? And, and that that does wonders for people who, especially in this area and this category in their marriage, it's so private and so vulnerable. So many people feel broken or inadequate or that something is wrong or something is wrong with their relationship. And so much of this data, I think, calms the heart and the soul and the mind yeah. to give them the peace to know like you're okay. And there's actually hope from here. Yeah. So what we- I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, candidly, one of the things that we've seen in a lot of these areas of marriage and life and parenting and, you know, whatever, a lot of the anxiety just comes from, is anybody else wrestling with this? Am I the only one? You know, I feel isolated. I feel alone. And on this topic, you mentioned kind of a piece of this, but one of the things that I realized in tackling this topic over the years of the research that we have done, especially with married couples, is this is really the only area of marriage that we never talk about, even with our closest friends. Yeah. And so there's no grid out there. The only thing that we know is what has been our personal experience and what we've seen on TV. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And of course, what we see on TV is full of myths. (laughs) So that actually introduces problems rather than help. And so that's one of the things that we were super excited about is so that people can actually know, no, like all of these issues are things that millions of other couples deal with. Yeah. And you know, I, first of all, I'm so glad that you wrote a book on this and did the research on it, but I have to tell you before um, you came out with this book, and this is probably why I was so excited that you came out with it, is four years, ever since you've put out um, what was for women only and for men only, and then later you came out with for couples only that I think pulls those two together. Um, 
for years, I have told people, if you want a great, great chapter on women and their sexuality and how women see Mm. um, sex and intimacy, I think it was chapter seven. At least that's what I told everybody. I think it's chapter (laughs) seven in um, For Men Only, because those books were written for your spouse to read about you. And so it was a message to men about what women think about sex. And I would tell everybody that is hands down the best chapter I have read uh, that explains what it's like for women. And there's some great stuff out there. I'm a huge, um, I love Doug Rosenau and like, and all of the content, um, Julie Slatterly, Slatterly that's um, got her podcast. So there's some great content out there. But to your point, I really loved the data that was behind it, the normalizing and, and the way that you communicated it to husbands. So the <laughs> fact that you came out with like, we're just going to write a whole book about it and we're going to bring sites yes. in and like, <laughs> Amazing, right? So, um, so let's jump in on because I know that's what we're really here for. They really want to know what you have to say. So let's jump in. Um, and I appreciate your vulnerability and and talking through what you found. And so I think just to start off, like you brought up the myths, you brought up um the data. And so I think just to start off, like what was um you already kind of shared a little bit of your why, but what was like one of the biggest, was there a surprising find in all of this? Was there something that you walked out that you were like, wow, I understand? And that's so much better than I understood it before that stands out to you. Well, okay, I'll be really honest. Everything surprised me. Really? really? <laughs> yes. Nothing surprised Dr. Mike. Nothing at all. Like <laughs> he's heard it all. Nothing surprised him. Everything surprised me and Jeff. And some of that was candidly by design because there was no point in our minds to put out a book that actually covers a bunch of things people are already kind of aware of. Yeah. And so we really, we were really honing in for the three years of this project. We were really trying to, to be very laser focused on what are the things that people tend to miss? Mm. What are the misunderstandings that they have? What are the reasons that they're having heartache that it doesn't need to be there if they just knew such and such. So We were kind of the guinea pigs. Jeff and I were like the canary in the coal mine. Like if we were surprised, then it's like, yes, okay. (laughs) That's That's a good topic to kind of dial in on a little more. I think I had several. Um, the, one of the big picture ones that I will say that was very surprising and very encouraging is that is to find out that actually most couples, even ones dealing with heartache, um, confusion, you know, disappointment, whatever, most couples aren't as far apart as I think they are. Mm-hmm. Where there are a lot, there is a lot, there is a lot more of a desire for connection on the part of both people. And they are much closer to being on the same page than they realize. And so that as a starting point was a huge encouragement because then it doesn't feel like it's this big impossible lift. It feels like, oh my gosh, there are some simple things that we can do. Well, and what's interesting about that is you talk with couples and they, um, it takes sometimes an outside source to go, you guys realize you're saying the same thing, right? <laughs> like, like you hear, I, I mean, you see like, that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and we know what that's like in our own relationship when you're so consumed with your insecurities or so consumed with your fear. Um, so whether you're talking about frequency of sex or, um, quality of sex or whether you're talking about connection versus whatever, right? Like you tend to, I think, communicate communicate with your own language and your spouse can be saying almost the same thing from their perspective. But what you found was that really when it, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when it came to frequency, Mm -hmm. when it came to desire for connection, that, um, that couples were really actually more aligned than they thought. Well, I'll give you an example. It's hard to it's hard to describe verbally, but I'll try um, because it was so powerful. We we saw some of the numbers coming back in, and um, our co-author uh, Dr. Seitzma, he just he and I are on the total same page about being numbers nerds. <laughs> we mm-hmm. just we love being able to dig into the data, and he showed me. He said in one of our meetings, "I want to put a graph up here for you to see this." I just finished analyzing this particular part of the survey, and I went, "Wait, that's not saying what I think it's saying." He's like, "Yep," and what we found 
is that when you ask couples how much sex they're having, and the number is, let's just say, and I'm, I'm going to give you a um, example of an average. One of the averages that we found that was important was that the average couple was having sex a one and a third. It's like one and a third times per week. Mm-hmm. Right? Whole other topic on how do you do a third sex, but yeah, I, mean, I know. It's not what you're saying. People always say, how do you do third? And like, do you stop a third of the way through? I'm like, no, that means four times every three weeks. <laughs> okay. But he pulled that up that with the average, that's the average of what the couples were actually engaging in. And then he layered on top of it a graph of how much did they want? Mm. And I looked at it and I went, that graph is saying that both the husband and the wife want more sex than they're having. And he said, yes. So like, for example, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like the average wife, instead of one and a third times a week, it would be two times a week. Of what she wanted. That she wanted. Yeah. And the average husband would be two and a half times a week or whatever the actual numbers were. It was something similar to that. And so neither person is getting what they want. Mm. And so what that does is it it takes the um, blame game off the table. And it makes it makes a very common dynamic um, that actually you've probably seen in working with couples that Dr. Mike has seen, where you know you ask the couples what is this for you, and then you find out that wow, both people want actually more connection than they're getting, and the higher desire person turns to the lower desire person and says, "Well, why aren't we having that?" Mm. and that's the right question, right? Because yeah. until you know that, the question is, why aren't you, yeah. right? To the lower desire person, why aren't you having sex more? And it's really so much pressure yeah. on that one person. And they feel like it's my fault. Something's wrong. The higher desire person thinks that something's broken. I'm not desirable. My partner is just frigid. Like all the things you tell yourself, And suddenly it's like, no, wait a minute. (laughs) Instead of being on opposite sides of the table and kind of blaming each other, then you put yourself on the same side of the table. And instead of why aren't you, it's why aren't we? Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, well, there's all sorts of these reasons. And basically, to some degree, that was the entire book. What are those reasons? And that allows couples to talk about them. Well, and you described beautifully, like there's so much in the book that we, there's no way to do it in a podcast. And it's, and it's almost better for you to have a book to be able to see the numbers and see where you land. And you guys did a great job of all the appropriate caveats of, um, like there's a certain percentage of where women are the higher drive. Absolutely. 24%, not a tiny number. Yes. Say that number again, just in case people didn't hear it. 24% of couples, the wife is the higher desire. So that's one out of every four. That is not a tiny number. Yeah. And so can you share with everybody, what are those different drives? Sure. Desires, I'm sorry. Yeah. The different types of desire is a, let me, let me just back up two seconds and set this up because one of the big myths, um, that relates to what I was saying earlier is the concept of if we're not connecting as much as it seems like one person wants, then the myth, the misunderstanding is that there's just one reason why. Mm. And it's that lower desire person. They just have a lower sex drive. Yeah, and they, that, they are the reason. They are the reason. Yeah. And the reason is in most cases what people think it's, well, they just have a lower sex drive. And I have a higher sex drive. And so that's the reason for the disconnect, which, as I mentioned, you know, puts a lot of pressure on the lower desire person, et cetera. And what we actually found that was so encouraging is that, yeah, sure, one person may have a lower desire than the other, a lower drive, but that is usually not the main reason for the disconnect. And that one of the big ones, one of the big reasons is that there are actually two different types of desire. And most people 
aren't aware of this Mm -hmm. because we've absorbed this idea from Hollywood. (laughs) We've absorbed Mm -hmm. this idea from the movies that there's just this one way that sex works. And so we have this thought, like everybody thinks this, not, you know, men, women, everybody thinks this, where you've seen it a hundred times on screen where the guy and the girl look at each other and there's some sort of spark, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have this surge of desire. They feel this desire. So they start kissing and pretty soon the clothes are off and they're in bed, Mm -hmm. right? And so what that portrays is you felt a surge of desire and you did something about it. Yeah. And that is indeed one type of desire, but it is not the only type. There's a second primary type of desire. You could call that first type um, the I'm hungry for you kind of type of desire. You could call that initiating desire. But the second primary type of desire you could call receptive desire. And here's what I found when you ask, if you, if you were to ask me personally, what I found most surprising, it was this. Um, because it turns out receptive desire, that person physiologically the pattern of desire occurs in the reverse order. Describe what that means. Physiologically, I know everybody's like, what? (laughs) So literally where the initiating desire person feels desire, gets aroused and takes action, the person with receptive desire does not usually feel that sense of desire up front. That person decides to get engaged sexually with their spouse. They make a conscious decision. And then as things go along, assuming that it's positive, and this is all assuming that, you know, there's goodwill in the relationship. This is, you know, there's some baseline assumptions here, but assuming that it's a positive experience, then that physiology then starts to get aroused and then feels that sense of desire that their spouse may have felt from the very beginning. Like that could come five to 10 minutes in. And so, which makes people feel in the past, I think before this information, I think it left people feeling ashamed or feeling broken or feeling, um, That pressure that you talked about, if the initiating high desire or higher drive person really wanted that Hollywood myth that we just are both there at the same time, we work the same way. So what's wrong that it's not happening for you the same way it's happening for me? Well, it's something, it's the feeling is something is wrong, Mm -hmm. right? Like that, that, for example you just have you, the receptive desire person, because I just didn't realize it was receptive desire, you, the maybe the lower desire person, there's something just wrong in you. Um, I was literally, I was um, just on another podcast with a marriage pastor, good guy, you know, who's very well informed about this stuff. And he said, when he read this section, when he started to realize this, he had literally just told his wife, I think like they said a week ago, he had literally said to her, well, maybe there's some pill that you could take, you mm-hmm. know, that would increase your desire. And the reality is that's the assumption mm-hmm. for most people is that there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. And so the person with that type of lower desire, they think they're broken too. Something's mm-hmm. wrong with me. And the reality is there's there could, I guess, be something wrong. I mean, there are medical issues out there, but most of the time, it's literally just a different type of desire. And let me, can I just give you an example of of one of the things we heard so often early on in the research process? Um, We kind of, we put out a fun little informal survey to all of our followers and a bunch of friends, and they just passed it around. And it was a one question. And it was basically, um, if you could ask a sex therapist, any question, one question, about your intimate life, what would it be, you know? And by far the top question that came in was, why isn't my spouse interested? Mm. And that's the problem is that we assume it means they're not interested as opposed to now that we know, no, they are interested. It's just activated completely differently. The interest is activated by taking action. 
And so that then that takes it off the I'm not desirable, what's wrong with me that you don't want me like it takes all that off the table. And it allows you to say, okay, so if we're just wired physiologically differently, how do we work with that rather than against it? Well, and this brings up a question, Shanti, is, you know, and I'm going to be stereotypical based off of the numbers that you saw. Yeah. So we're stereotypically talking about um, women being the lower lower drive. Um, 73% of women are receptive desire. Yes, yes, that are receptive. And so I guess this is partly a research question, partly like I would think a woman question too. But I think, you know, what, what do you believe happens when you have those kind of messages for that long. You know, I think Mm -hmm. where, where we take this into action or practically, how do we move forward? Um, on one hand, it's helping the higher drive, um, higher desire person to be able to, to maybe slow down and recognize, um, that there is kind of a different process for that person. And I think probably most of them are going to be eager (laughs) to test out that (laughs) process. Right. Um, but I, I have to like pause for a moment and wonder, the messages that that um, lower drive receptive spouse, the messages that they've been receiving for so long, how do you rewire that? Especially when you're saying the antidote here is basically to acknowledge that you have a choice, that you get to choose this, um, to choose to pursue your relationship and a better sex life. And so there's, I'm sure this moment between um, the messages that I'm hearing in my mind that have been there for a very long time and making a conscious choice. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Well, there's actually, believe it or not, there's actually two ways that this plays out where you're having to make different decisions because the person who is going, oh my gosh, I've had these beliefs about myself and maybe I've believed that you know, I'm just not a sexual person, or I'm just not interested, something's wrong with me, I'm too low of desire. Um, All of those things can help become like, kind of shaming, Mm -hmm. um, can kind of shut you down, it can create anxiety, which, you know, does not help with the process at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there is a freedom and a life that comes. And you have to sort of mentally and emotionally make yourself realize, no, I am actually wired just in a different way. My physiology is just different and there's neither wrong nor right. It's just different. And so if I embrace that, then suddenly now it's like, oh, wow, I I am making a choice Mm -hmm. and I am deciding to get engaged, knowing that it will feel be good for me in a few minutes. And I'm appreciating and honoring my spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is actually quite a bit of power in that. There's quite a bit of of a whole new type of um, love towards your spouse that comes when you realize that that's the choice that you're making. Um, But the second that, you know, how I said that there's a second piece to this as well, there's a completely other switch that has to happen for the person who has the initiating desire, who is married to someone who has receptive desire. And that is, by the way, the, um, the, by far the largest pattern that one person has initiating, one person has receptive. And that reality um, also means that the person who is the initiator, who has that initiating desire, what they have to shift is they have to realize, oh, if my spouse is making a decision Mm -hmm. to get engaged with me, what are they making the decision based on? Mm. And it's usually based on how we've related the rest of the day. It's usually based on what else is going on in the relationship. And so that's a big wake up call for the person with initiating desire is it's not just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a microwave and she's a crock pot being stereotypical. And so I need to give her more time, Mm -mm. like more time may or may not do anything. I need to give her anticipation time, like flirting with her in the kitchen in the morning about what I'd love to have happen later. And then I need to be talking to her and being kind and not ignoring her. And, you know, 
all of that kind of stuff is what the receptive desire person will make a decision based on. Which reaffirms your previous research, right? On um, how women especially um, valued feeling assured in the relationship, that that's what was communicated to them as loving, which was you assure me that we are okay and the relationship is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those actions outside of the bedroom really are giving that assurance throughout the day so that we're not going into the bedroom I'm going, are we, are we, are we not okay? I mean, like, have you even thought about me today or like, right, like, exactly. Um, well, and it, oh, go ahead. If, if I could, if I could just also say though, beyond the stereotype, we actually found it was more than 30% of men who were receptive desire. Now, most men were initiating desire, but that's a pretty big number too. Yeah. And, and it tends to be a little more towards the older men. Mm -hmm. Right. Like as some men start out initiating and then they get to age 60 or 65 and they're like, huh, I'm a little different than I was. Mm -hmm. But that person, that receptive desire guy, he is also making a decision and it's it is it is the same concept. But it's this is where we go back into some of the other research because men's insecurities and vulnerabilities tend to be a little different than for most women, for most women, his insecurity and his question that he's wondering, you know, isn't, are you, you know, do you love me today? Are we okay? His is, does she think I'm any good at what I do? Like she keeps, like I put the dishes in the dishwasher and she comes along behind me and puts them in the right way. Like clearly I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. And we as women have to then go, oh, like that's, it's literally just a different vulnerability in their heart that we have to care for. So it works both ways. Yeah. And I think, I think there was a moment in the book where it talked about how, I think it was a Zoom call that you were doing with someone, a woman who said like that she recognized that if she's being critical of her husband, then it's, it's harder for her husband to show up too and want to jump into sex. Right. Yes. Um, and one of my favorite points was where um, I think it was a, it might have been an older gentleman, but it was, it was a husband who said that it was, there was a light bulb moment when he realized that his um, receptive spouse was actually choosing him. Mm-hmm. And like, you almost have to camp out on that story yeah. for a moment and reread it because if yeah. you read it too fast, it's almost like he's glossing over something, but really this was re- like a big deal for him to, to actually accept that it's it's different between thinking of it from the perspective of she she's choosing sex and she's just made a desire to be like okay I'll have sex versus he's she's choosing me over yeah. choosing something else and that that could be loving. Well, and and his that point which I think is so powerful. Yeah. And any any couple where the husband is the initiating desire and the wife is receptive desire. I hope they listen to this because what that husband realized is that before realizing this, his assumption was if his wife ever made the first move, it was because she just had this desire for sex, right? Mm-hmm. Like he, like she just needed it. Like it was this physiological urge and this physiological desire. And, and so she was doing something about it. And then suddenly he went, oh, no, wait, like that's, that's not what she's feeling. And she is choosing me. Yeah. And she is, she is making this conscious choice to be with me because she loves me because she wants to connect with me, even though she doesn't have all those hormones going yet. Right. Like that's, that's not going in. Wow, what an yeah. act of love and honor and appreciation. And it, it, you know, he had been married for, I don't remember, 20 or 30 years at that point. And, um, and for him to go all this time, I thought it was that she just wanted it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and realized, no, she, she, she's choosing me. Yeah. I thought it was so powerful too. And I, I hope everybody listening hears that on both sides, that whether it is receiving it and changing your perspective to receive your spouse's choice in such a powerful way and allow that to like sink in or whether you are the, um, 
the low drive spouse that goes, that sees the influence that you have, the power that you have yeah. behind that choice and the permission. I think, um, Shanti, this gives people permission to take that step before they have desire. That's okay. And that's, that's not fine. out of obligation. It's not yeah. loving. It's, um, it doesn't have to be, um, it's not selfish and it's and it's not something that's has to be dishonoring to you to trust your body trust um yeah. your process to just take the step yeah i mean it's if you think about it what this does is it brings this whole other layer of intimacy and beauty mm. into both sides right to know that we're not just I don't know, animals yeah, <laughs> right? to, know yeah. that to know that it's not just about a matter of, you know, two people whose hormones go crazy and, you know, they can't help it. Like there is a, there is a lot of intimacy that's built once you actually start talking about this with your spouse yeah. and go, Oh my gosh, is this, is this how you feel? And oh my word, like this whole time I never knew. And you start sharing and pretty soon it's not just physical intimacy that's being built. It's truly this emotional intimacy as well. Well, and again, hearing tied into your other research as well, one of my other favorite um, pieces that I know was revolutionary for you, but also for everybody else that read your work was the <laughs> whole concept of, um, I think it was what, 99.96% of couples that were the happiest couples um, s- believed that their spouse had their best interests at heart. Yes. And that's tied into this too. Yes, it is very tight into this. So what you're referring to was the research from, we had done this study of the happiest couples Mm -hmm. and what are they doing differently than everybody else? And one of the things was that every, even when they got hurt, when they hurt each other's feelings, because everybody gets hurt, even the happiest couples have that, they believed the best of their spouse's intentions towards Mm -hmm. them. And what we found is that it it wasn't wishful thinking um, because, and it was 99.26 something, something percent of people deeply care about their spouse Mm -hmm. and they want the best for them. And we actually were really profoundly encouraged to see that that was the case, even amongst the couple's that were in the most desperate state Mm -hmm. in their marriage and, you know, very, very unhappy. Even those couples, it was 97% of the the spouses really care. And so that's part of what we're talking about here as well is believe the best of your spouse's intentions towards you. Don't assume, Oh, they just want to jump into bed because they just want it. Or, Oh, you know, he doesn't care about me. He's just been away all week looking at other women and he just wants to come home and be satisfied. And, you know, no, like believe the best of their intentions in the vast majority of cases, that's going to be the truth. Well, and especially when you have influence over your own personal choices, whether it's a choice to serve in advance or whether it's a choice to take a step before you feel a sense of desire. Either way, that choice to to have the right perspective in your mind of your spouse, I mean, there's something like it's everything just seems to tank as soon as you start believing the worst about them, right? Yeah. And your ability to follow through and even have that kind of influence, like I think everything starts to crumble from there. And so I I see it as a huge component too. Um, Okay. I do have, there's one part that I'm going to read out of the book that I okay. was hoping, I'm hoping this was one of the sections that you wrote. It sounds very statistic-y. So, <laughs> well, Dr. Right. Mike is just as much of a numbers nerd as I am. So it could be either of us. But, but I'm sure you'll it. have a thought about it either way. So um, st- I don't know if st- statistic is a word. I, I like it. Let's I go like with it. Too. <laughs> okay. So there's this great section, um, as you are getting closer to the end of the book where you have, and I wish we could dive, um, a lot into the importance of curiosity, which I agree is, yeah. is huge. So I'm going to give you a chance to, um, to respond about the importance of curiosity, but there's this one paragraph that I felt like would be really helpful to read. And it says, um, and there is clearly a benefit to curiosity. For example, example, if your spouse views you as curious about what matters to them sexually, you are more than 
three times as likely to have a very happy marriage than if your spouse views you as less than curious. Among those who were happy in marriage, 60% said they had curious spouses compared to just 17% among those unhappy in marriage. Similarly, if your spouse views you as curious, you both are more than three times as likely to be very happy with how often you have sex. So can you unpack maybe a little bit the importance of curiosity and if if those were your numbers to share? Yes, absolutely. What you thought? (laughs) Yeah, well, those are both of our numbers. But (laughs) truly, one of the things that um, we were we were very very struck by and very encouraged by is that if there is any problem in your marriage at all with this area or any other. And certainly if it is related to your intimate life and certainly if it's confusion or whatever, curiosity is usually the antidote. Mm -hmm. Like whatever is going on, it is almost always now not, this will not be the case 100% of the time, but close. It is almost always the case that there is something that you just are not understanding about your spouse and they are not understanding about you. There's something that matters. There's a a hurt, a place of hurt that's being triggered, whatever it is. And if you will kind of step forward into that and try to be curious about what's going on in your spouse, spouse's heart and mind, or even curious to some degree about your own self, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it opens things up and it, it lowers the defensiveness, um, because that's often there if, you know, well, why aren't we connecting and you never seem to want me and blah, 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 that shuts you down. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you have that approach of, I wonder if, Mm -hmm. Right. I wonder if it's kind of the same thing that that we said at the very beginning of when spouses look at that graph of nobody is getting as much sex as they're wanting, like neither the husband or the wife is is getting as much. And they look at that and they were like, well, why aren't we? That's a curious question. Why aren't we? What's what's going on? You know, what do you what do you think is in the way? And you start asking each other that and you hear things like and I'm going to give a stereotypical example, but we heard it a bunch of times. So like a stereotypical example would be, well, you know, one of the things that's an issue is that, you know, you go up to bed and you're waiting for me, but I feel like I can't relax until I've cleaned the kitchen up and like everything is neat. And by the time I get upstairs, 20 minutes later, you're snoring. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. And well, why do you, what's the reason why you feel a need to clean the kitchen? Well, I just feel like I've been in a mess all day. And this is like the one time of day that it's just starting over fresh and I'm not starting over in the morning in a bad mood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what could we do about that? Well, maybe you could help me clean the kitchen Mm -hmm. and that way it takes 10 minutes instead of 20 and we both go upstairs at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that all that started with just a curious question of, well, tell me what's, you know, going on in your mind about this, that kind of approach it's so simplistic. It almost feels like it shouldn't matter. Like it's yeah. such a simplistic thing. And yet it was profoundly powerful as you saw from those numbers. Yeah. <laughs> profoundly in so many ways. Um, you know, I was trying to think of like, what is the opposite? Like when there is not curiosity, what fills that space? And I think for some couples, I mean, apathy could certainly be in there, but I Mm -hmm. think there's also shame and I think there's fear, you know, and for me, and what? Criticism. Criticism. Yeah, that thought process Mm -hmm. comes in again. Um, One of the first things I thought about was, you know, for the longest time, in some ways, it's still a little bit there, but for the longest time, I had this crazy phobia of um, fear, and I think it came from a hot air balloon when I was a kid. But that doesn't matter. But it was. But I had this fear of getting like walking up on a large ship, like a cruise ship, right? Or. Mm-hmm. 
getting on a large plane. Like I could get on a plane if we're going down the like, um, you know, like you normally get on a commercial <laughs> plane, right? But like, if I'm like getting on a plane from the ground and it's a giant plane, like hmm. oof, a little bit overwhelming and just a, a, a valid, like for real phobia, like I would cry and run away and all this stuff. Okay. Well, when I had this opportunity to go overseas, um, I knew in advance I would have to get on a C-17, which is like the biggest military plane that you can roll a tank in that thing. And yeah. there is no way to get on that plane except going up the back There's of no it. There's no debt bridge. No. <laughs> no. And I knew that I was going to have to face this fear. And I knew all these eyes were going to be on me and I couldn't freak out. Like I just, I cannot show the fear in this setting. Hmm. Um but I, when I got there, I was so excited. I was so excited about the trip. I was so excited about what I was going to be experiencing. I was so excited about the adventure of it, um, that as I'm approaching this plane and I've also never been in this plane before. And so I was also like very excited to see this plane, uh, especially on the inside, but mm -hmm. like that I'd never seen before and be a part of this experience. And as I'm walking towards this plane, I'm also realizing I have no fear. Like I have no fear. And I had this amazing experience on that plane. And really it was because it kind of goes align with the research with gratitude, which is that you cannot have gratitude and negativity at the same, at the same time. time. And you can't have curiosity and criticalness at the same yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Which is remarkable if you have not experienced it in your life. The importance of that curiosity piece, I think, is so huge for people who are swimming in shame, swimming in fear. And you and I, and you mentioned it earlier about how anxiety and tension and fear and all of those things can sabotage the whole process, especially yes. for women, but for yeah. men too. And so like the power of changing your thoughts about something, the, the moment that you say, I'm going to leverage curiosity instead of allowing the fear and shame to be there yeah. and the freedom and the peace to know that those two cannot coexist is huge. Yeah. I love the way you put that. That is a perfect description. It's, I think it's game changing. And I think that the numbers that you guys have found show that it's game changing if you can leverage the curiosity. Um, and, you know, we, you don't, at least that I saw in there, you didn't necessarily go into, although you mentioned whether that's curiosity about frequency, whether it's curiosity about what your spouse is asking for, or whether it is curiosity about your own body. There's lots of these different areas. So is there any other place that that showed up in stories or research or where that curiosity really came into play? Well, the curiosity in general in marriage is so powerful where, for example, if we go back to our original research for, for women only and for men only mm -hmm. about men and women, that is one of the big areas where because there are some of these statistically significant differences, now it's not everybody, right? But you could say probably on average about 80% of men um, and about 80% of women have just have different insecurities from one another. For example, they have different vulnerabilities. They have different like hidden concerns down in the heart. And there is an immense openness that suddenly comes up when a wife looks at her big, strong, confidence husband and says, wait, you mean like you doubt whether you're a good father? Like you're a great father. Why? Tell me what it feels like. What do you mean? And to actually have that openness, <laughs> to be willing to entertain that idea and dig in and try to figure out what that feels like. And for him to be able to say things like, wait, you mean when I'm mad and I go stomping away, you actually wonder if we're okay? Mm. Like in my mind, it's just an argument. Tell me what that feels like. And to hear her be able to say, yeah, it feels like this, uh... Like, are we okay? I need to feel reassured. Really? You know, that type of curiosity, again, it's it's so basic and yet it is so powerful. 
So powerful. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left um, together. And so I do have a, a, a good high level question that I definitely wanted to get in for you. But is there anything else that was maybe one of your favorite things that stood out either to you personally or something that you heard a lot from couples that you were really glad that you found? Yeah. Well, we've covered what I honestly thought was one of the most important things, which is the the concept that if we're not connecting as much as one person wants, it's not usually because one person just has lower desire, yeah, like a lower sex drive, because that really does mm-hmm. put a lot of pressure on that person. And that's usually the wife. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a huge one that I hear about a lot as well. Um, I think the bigger question that I had is, you know, you have you have studied and researched a lot of big topics that um, tend to be what I would, what you'd probably also call the biggest hot topics of couples, right? Yeah. Like you just yeah. decided to write a book about yeah. every big hot topic that couples struggle with. <laughs> Please no. Well, this is probably the biggest one, right? Right. It is. You know, I don't know if you've covered fully in one book, in laws, but that's like in the top three, Uh, right, for couples. (laughs) (laughs) But um, you've covered um, how do you understand love and how do you experience love in your relationship? And you've covered um, now this intimacy topic. You've covered a book on uh, money, money, which in the last interview that I did with you, you shared was a little bit more of one of those personal ones for you in your yeah, marriage right. of like starting yeah. conversation about that. So I think, I mean, we will list all of Sean, all of Shanti's books in the <laughs> show notes for you guys, um, because they're just so fantastic. But I think my question for you is, you know, you really have dug into all of these major issues. Um, and I guess this is kind of a high level career question. As you look back, um, what would you say is it, if you could summarize somehow, and this is crude to ask you this, to, to be an analyst and somebody asks you a high level question. <laughs> but, um, if you, what, when you look back on these big hot topics that have so much misunderstanding behind it, what is the general summary of what you have found? Is there a theme that you've found in all of these when it comes to communication and reducing mis- miscommunications in these yeah. areas? By far, um, the, the the biggest theme is actually one of the things that we said at the very beginning of this interview, um, which is that the vast majority of couples, even couples in really desperate place, are actually not nearly as far apart as mm-hmm. they think they are. We What we have found is the average person who's average couple that's dealing with heartache, you know, they think it's these big issues. And and yeah, okay, sometimes those issues do exist, but usually you have a husband and a wife who care about each other a lot. And they're both trying so hard, but maybe because they don't realize some of these things or they're operating on bad information, they're trying hard in the wrong areas. Yeah. Or they're maybe missing each other, or they're trying really hard and actually hurting each other and they would never intend to. And so that's what we're really passionate about because we find that if people can just get some of these aha moments, they can try hard in the right areas. Shanti, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for the work and investment and the um, the research that you're doing that I know is so insanely helpful. Um, where can everybody find um, access to everything that you're working on? Oh, you're so sweet. Well, the easiest place is to go to secretsofsexandmarriage.com, which is the website that we created. It's the same as the title of the book. And, um, and it will link then to our other website, um, which they can get other information about other work we do. I told you it'd be an amazing conversation with Shanti. She always brings such great, relevant truth to often what is really complicated. And marriage especially can feel really complicated when you are seeing more of your differences than your similarities. And I think that's what's fascinating about Shanti's work, especially in this book, Secrets of Sex and Marriage, Eight Surprises That Make All the Difference. You can find it on Amazon, on her website, and probably wherever books are sold. Um, But it does a great job of normalizing not only um, how most couples... 
feel about sex, but what most couples struggle with in sex, and hopefully normalizing whatever is going on in your relationship, whether there is differences or not. And so I highly encourage you to pick up the book. But a couple things stand out to me after my conversation with Shanti, and that is, number one, um, you're probably a lot more normal than you think, and your marriage is probably a lot more normal than you think. And I hope that that encourages someone out there that is feeling like maybe the problems or the struggles that you're having just feel too overwhelming and um, and that you shouldn't be struggling with them. Sometimes it helps bring down the stress of whatever conflict you have to know that it's actually a normal conflict for a lot of people to have. And if it is normal, that means there's opportunity for growth and opportunity for intimacy in working through those differences. So the second thing, um, other than normalizing that I thought about with Shanti's conversation is that she invites us into conversation and curiosity with our spouse. And so whenever you find yourself with these differences, get curious, ask questions, um, launch into a new conversation with your spouse, be willing to see them as human, flawed and insecure because we all know we are too, right? And so it doesn't mean that we are the complete answer for our spouse's insecurity or not even the other way around either. I think it's more more about realizing that we have incredible influence in speaking the truth to our spouse that might be struggling that day with believing the lies about themselves. So remember you have incredible influence and that when you have these conflicts or these differences, get curious, ask questions, and go into a learning mode where you maybe discover something new about your spouse. And finally, I would just say, um, pick up the book, read the book together, read it out loud if you need to even. But it's a great book that will trigger new conversation, new dialogue about an area that a lot of us out there struggle with having conversations about this. And so if you are one of those that don't struggle in this area or don't struggle with talking about it, I hope you will recommend this book to others that do struggle. Um, Stay um, tuned for the next episode, which will be with Dr. Mike. I know a lot of you love listening to him as well. And so more to come on this topic. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for listening to the Life Giver Podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast or leave a review so others can find it as well. Were you thinking of someone else who would benefit from hearing today's episode? You can be a life giver to them by simply sharing it with an encouraging note. If you'd like to connect with me or find out more about my work, you can visit www.coryweathers.com.